Is the heated bed in your 3D printer underpowered and slow? Well, here's a guide to fitting a mains powered silicon bed that heats up to 100 degrees in under a minute. This video deals with mains voltage wiring, which has the potential to kill. This is not for beginners. Please consult a professional before attempting these procedures. Some 3D printers just have poor heated bed performance. It's not very fun or productive to start a print and have to wait 10 or 15 minutes before the first layer finally goes down. I've had to do quite a bit of troubleshooting with the CR10 Max, but one of the nice things about it is the heated bed. Inside the printer is a second, dedicated 24 volt, 500 watt meanwhile power supply, which heats the enormous bed quickly. My Ender 5, however, I've been modifying to print high temperature filaments, and with those requirements, it's starting to struggle a little. There's simply not the room for a second power supply, but fortunately, there's another solution in the form of a mains powered silicon bed. This mod is fairly affordable, not too hard to fit, and offers fantastic performance. You can do it on many, many 3D printers, so let's get started with my step-by-step -step guide. Firstly, some background. Our 3D printer takes 110 or 220 volt alternating current from the wall, and then the power supply converts that down to either 12 or 24 volts direct current to feed our 3D printer and run the heaters, stepper motors, mainboards, fans, and everything else. Compared to the electricity that comes out of the wall, 24 volts direct current is definitely safer, but the conversion process does lose some efficiency and therefore a little bit of power. You can see on this graph that I've heated my bed to 120 degrees from 19 degrees and the performance is not great. It takes just under 15 minutes to reach this level. Since this printer is regularly going to be printing high temperature filaments that need a really hot heated bed, this is definitely an area that I'm keen to improve upon. So how is an AC heated bed different? Well, instead of taking DC from the power supply, we use the mains power direct from the wall to power the heated bed. There's a lot more power available, but as we know, electricity from the wall can kill us, so we need to be careful with our implementation. This is a popular upgrade for the original CR10 because they had poor heating performance, and a company called Kinovo has an off-the-shelf product for that printer. For other printers, they do make a custom option, but that's not what I went with for this video. So here's the one I found on AliExpress. It was just over US $32, and there's a couple of things you need to check for when you're ordering yours. Firstly, you need to select the correct voltage. In Australia, we have 220 volt. In the United States and other parts of the world, 110 volts. The other thing is making sure that it already has holes for your specific 3D printer. The heating element zigzags back and forth inside here, so if you were to try and drill your own hole, you're probably going to damage it. We can see our power consumption is 500 watts, and that's more than double the factory heater. We can also see we have 1.1 meters of wire for our heated bed, as well as our thermistor, which will be plenty. The final piece of information we need is the type of thermistor for when we update the firmware. It arrived after a week and a half, and it looked exactly like I expected. In the middle we have the thermistor, and these skinny orange wires will run all the way back to the main board to connect it and be able to read the temperature. The white wires are for the actual AC power to heat the bed, and it has the cutouts that should match up with an Ender 3 or 5. On the back we have a 3M sheet to attach it, and it's also labelled 220 volts, which is good too. Physical installation is pretty straightforward, and we start by removing the thumb levelling screws on the bottom of the printer. Once all four of those are out of the way, it's simply a matter of lifting it clear and out of the printer. In the corner, our power wires are soldered to the stock board, and the thermistor is taped to the centre, so we can start by peeling off the captain tape that's holding it down in place. We want a completely bare surface to stick our new silicon heater to, so we need to remove all of the captain tape and then lift the thermistor out of the way. I always like things to be reversible, so I got out a soldering iron, melted the solder, and removed the power wires. I then used some solder braid to melt and absorb any chunks of solder left over. Not perfect, but clean and flat enough to install the new heater over the top. I took this chance to verify that all of the holes lined up perfectly, and they did. This one would be compatible with Ender 3 and Ender 5. I then used some IPA and some paper towel to clean off any grease and fingerprints on the bottom to help the new silicon bed to stick better. The adhesive backing can then be peeled off. I turned it over and applied some light pressure along one edge, and then used my hand to slowly work from one side to the other. 
Our first safety measure is a thermal fuse. Their operation is pretty simple. When they reach their rated temperature, they permanently fail and break the circuit. I've selected a thermal fuse with a limit of 133 degrees Celsius. We need to wire the fuse in line with one of the heater wires on the underside of the silicon pad. It's important to not solder these wires. We don't want any chance of it failing and arcing. Instead, use crimp terminals like I'm showing here. We need the fuse to be in contact with the bottom of the silicon heater. I used high temperature insulation tape to hold it down firmly. To make sure the fuse can never detach, and also as a safeguard to the adhesive on the silicon mat failing, we're going to sandwich some cork on the underside of our silicon pad. These 6mm pieces were from the local hardware store, they're about $2 each, and they're easy to cut with an X-Acto blade. The end of 3 and 5 bed are both 235 by 235 millimeters, and after we've cut this, we still need to mark, measure, and screw holes for the mounting bolts to go through. Here are all of the dimensions I used. The holes should be 32.5 millimeters in from each corner and be drilled with a diameter of 5 millimeters. With the cork prepared, it now gets pressed onto the underside of the silicon heater pad. I installed some fibrous washers on each bolt and then the factory springs back in their place. You can also see that I've cable tied the wiring to the heater to hold it neatly where I want it. We're now ready to reinstall. We simply reverse our steps, lowering it down lining up the bed leveling screws with the holes in the platform underneath and then reinstalling the knobs one at a time. If you're interested in what those yellow braces do, I tested those in an earlier video so please check it out. Next up we need to wire up our new heater and I started by removing the old wiring. I slid off the protective sheathing because I wanted to reuse that on the new heater cables. The old heated bed cables simply unscrew from the terminal block and the thermistor unplugs from the corner of the mainboard. I took the heater and thermistor wires for the new silicon bed and I fed the sheathing back over the top to protect them. Now you could cut the plug off the old thermistor but I like things to be reversible so instead I took the JST plug from an old busted fan and I soldered that onto the end after sizing up how long the wiring needed to be. Here it is soldered in place and polarity isn't important so you can ignore the red and black wires here when you plug it in. The old wiring for the original heated bed was pretty straightforward. 24 volts came in from the power supply and then a MOSFET was used to switch that to regulate power to the heated bed. You might think you can simply plug in the wires for the new heater in the same way. Nothing's going to blow up but performance will be terrible as it's expecting a lot more power to be coming through. As we're using high voltage alternating current from the wall that would fry the MOSFET, we need to introduce a solid state relay. There's not much current here so we can run some regular thin gauge wire from the bed output to the DC inputs of the SSR, being sure to match the polarity. The power for the heated bed now plugs in as follows. One of the wires goes directly to the pin labelled N for neutral. The other wire, labelled L for live, comes out of the power supply into one end of the SSR and then exits the SSR up to the heated silicon pad. The SSR will allow current through only when it gets the signal from the main board. As for the green and yellow earth wire, we'll explain that shortly. The Ender 5's AC input plug is fused. If you're performing this mod on a printer without this, please switch to one of these for your first round of protection against shorts. Now onto the SSR or solid state relay. And here are two examples. The one on the left is most likely a knockoff and not particularly safe. The one on the right, a reputable brand, but how do we tell the difference? The one on the left was bought on eBay for around 7 US dollars. The real Fotec brand is actually reputable, but this is not a genuine product. Linked in the description, courtesy of Tim from TH3D, are some articles on how to spot fake relays. It's got some great visual indicators on what to look for, but the important thing to know is they're capable of a lot less current than what's on the sticker. And when they fail, they'll probably fail with the circuit connected, and that means your heater won't turn off. The relay on the right I bought over the counter from a very reputable electronic store in Australia. One obvious thing is a huge increase in price, you can probably get them cheaper than this, but the fact that it costs more than a few dollars should be a good indication that it works as advertised. The other good sign is that it comes with a data sheet with all of the technical details of the solid state relay. When you're shopping for them you need to make sure you get one for AC control, and also make sure that the current rating will be above what you're switching. At 220 volts, 500 watts will only be a bit over 2 amps. But as a rule of thumb, the higher rated relay you get, the cooler it will run on low current. 
You'll see some footage coming up with the knockoff relay, but rest assured, once I had the good one, I switched to it and that's what's currently inside my printer. The SSR is clearly labeled negative and positive for the input from the mainboard, and then the other side is where the AC current goes through and is switched on and off. To do this properly, you'll need to crimp on some connectors and insert them into the terminals of the power supply. You can fit two terminals in at the same time if you rotate them so the two flat sides touch each other, and then tighten down the screw terminal, giving it a wiggle to make sure that nothing is loose. The last thing we want is loose or arcing wires inside our printer. Here's the wiring for mine finished as per my diagram, and you can see I've got a second SSR sitting in place because my new chamber heater will be mains powered as well. The other thing we need to take into account is the SSR getting hot. It says with over 10 amps, I definitely need a heat sink, but that's not me. So the last thing to check is an ambient temperature of over 40. With my printer sitting on full load for around 20 minutes, the temperature inside the enclosure stabilized pretty close to ambient at 21 degrees. I've checked that my solid state relays aren't gonna get too hot and melt anything, and you should do the same for your setup too. Now's a good time to revisit that earth, green and yellow wire on my diagram. Because I'm running a plastic 3D printed case, it's important to earth the solid state relay as well as the printer frame. To do this, I made up this custom loom that goes from the earth terminal of the power supply to both my solid state relays and then a final terminal to go to the frame. It's important to either scratch away the anodized surface or pick a bolt like I did that goes inside the aluminium frame. I chose this one down the bottom of the Z guide rails. With the printer turned off and the multimeter set to continuity, you touch the earth terminal on the power supply and the old aluminium heated bed and you want to make sure that they are connected. On an N to 5 this is straightforward as the bed only travels up and down, but on a printer where the Y axis moves the bed, please see my previous guide where I show you how to earth that safely. In Australia, RCDs are fitted to every home. Hypothetically, if the silicon were to break on the new heater and a live wire therefore touched the aluminium bed, current would flow back through our earth and trip the circuit breaker. For the rest of the world, I can't say whether you have one of these, hence the disclaimer at the start of the video. Finally, we're trying to stave off work hardening, and that's the process where a wire goes back and forth until it weakens and snaps. It's really important to reduce the risk of this happening on our high voltage wiring. Therefore, I strongly suggest you use a cable tie or similar to clamp down the bed heater cabling at the top of the printer so it can't wobble around and eventually suffer that same fate. Again, not foolproof, but definitely some good insurance. Now with my custom electronics case, everything on the left hand side gets covered, but that still means there's exposed mains wiring on the right hand side where I access the main board. I figured there was an easy and effective solution for this. So I hit up CAD, measured up the SSR and designed this simple part to clip on and cover the exposed terminals. It's linked below down in Thingiverse and should be quick and easy to print. Its function is pretty simple. It simply clips over the top of the solid state relay to hide the terminal somewhat at least. Not foolproof, but a step in the right direction. We can now turn our attention to the firmware. The first change is optional and that's in configuration.h. You might want to up your bed max temp to reflect what you're going to be printing with. The next change is actually essential for reading the temperature accurately and we need to pay attention to the type of thermistor listed on the ad. If we search the thermistor table for this, we can see that the several options, I just went with the first one which was number 11, I therefore come down to temp sensor bed and update that from sensor number 1 to sensor 11. Heated bed performance is normally quite slow, so with this new power comes new responsibility, so we should tweak our thermal runaway settings in configuration advanced.h. I recommend reducing the amount of seconds for protection bed period and bed temp period as low as you can get it without false positives. That's the minimum we need to get it to compile and after we upload our new firmware and ask the heated bed to do its thing, a light will come on on the SSR to indicate the current is flowing through to the bed. Let's repeat our test, once again starting at around 19 degrees and playing this again at full time speed. If you recall last time it took just under 15 minutes to hit this target temperature but this time it can do it in under 90 seconds. It reaches 100 degrees Celsius in under a minute. There is a slight problem however, when it reaches that temperature, it starts to fluctuate up and down. And that's because for this version of the firmware, the bed is using what we call bang bang control, simple switching on and off of the heater. And over a period of time, that produces oscillations in bed temperature, which we definitely don't want. In Marlin, there's a function called bed limit switching and some associated parameters with that 
I fiddled with them, but I didn't really have much luck. As you can see, the magnitude of the temperature swings decreased, but they were definitely still there. A much better solution is to instead enable PID temp bed. This will then use the same algorithm as the firmware uses for the hot end to regulate the temperature. After we compile and upload the firmware, we still need to run a PID auto-tune for the bed. The G code for that is M303, C5 for 5 cycles, E-1 for the bed instead of the nozzle, S100 for a temperature of 100 degrees. You can see where this has been performed in my graph in Octoprint. And if we switch to the terminal, we can see that it spat out our P, I and D values that we can feed back in to Marlin. We need to do them one at a time and the command is M304 and then P and then paste in the value. We then repeat this M304, I, paste in the value and finally M304, D and paste in the last value. For this to remain persistent, we need to then enter an M500 to save our settings to the EEPROM. It's worth verifying our new settings by again asking for a high temperature, seeing if the heating performance is affected and also if it still oscillates. I hit 120, comfortably under two minutes, and after I let it play out for a while, the oscillation was gone. Finally, some people suggested that heating up the bed that fast might warp the aluminium plate. I haven't experienced this yet, but if you're worried, you can turn down the max bed power to slow the heating performance. This means that we're ready to print, but just remember, if you're not running auto bed leveling, you need to re-level your bed. I'm really pleased with how this has turned out. It's now viable to quickly reach the type of temperatures I need for the types of filaments I want to use with my Ender 5. Not every printer needs this, but you could do it to most of them. Just be careful when you're shopping to correctly select your voltage. Make sure you get a bed with cutouts for mounting and take great care with that mains wiring. If you've got a 3D printer with poor heated bed performance, now is the time to name and shame it in the comments. Thank you so much for watching and until next time, happy 3D printing. G'day, it's Michael again. If you liked the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.